Is it possible for a mountain to speak and influence our lives? I'm here at Mount Katahdin in north central Maine in Baxter State Park. A mountain and a park that my family actually donated to the people of Maine to be held forever wild as a public park for mankind to come here in, a, in the right unspoiled way, in the words of my uncle, to enjoy the wilderness. He set up a wilderness park so that man and nature could come together and bring their gifts together. Watching the sunrise on Mount Katahdin in north central Maine. Mount Katahdin's in Baxter State Park, and it is one of the first places to receive the sun in the continental United States. Katahdin, uh, you see nature behaving as nature should, whether it's uh, gale force winds, or whether it's a, a horrible snowstorm, or a rock slide, or a mudslide. That is nature doing what nature is supposed to do. It is neither good nor bad, nature just is. Perhaps I most fully realized that this was primeval, untamed, and forever untamable nature, or whatever else men call it, while coming down this part of the mountain. Henry David Thoreau. And Katahdin has been revered through the ages by the Wabanaki Indians as a sacred place, as a home of the spirit, as a home of the creator. Mount Katahdin is, is our, the sacred mountain for the Wabanaki people. All of the people from the tribes in, in the state of Maine, and perhaps some in New Hampshire and Vermont, and even the ones in Ab Odenak, in, in uh, the Abenaki in Odenak, which is St. Francis Reserve, uh, they also honor and, and uh, pray, go pray and have ceremonies at uh, Mount Katahdin. Go visit the mountain if you can. Once you are in the mountain, you'll always return. And if you go by it, say I'll be back, because sometimes I do. I'll be back, and I go back. Sometimes I do ceremonies, sometimes I just sit there. And Katahdin also speaks to many who come here. People feel that its slopes speak to them, that its rocks, that the trees here, that the spirits come and speak through the clouds and through the weather and through the winds. I feel Katahdin is alive in the sense that it has spirit. You can feel its spirit on the trails that you walk, the surrounding terrain of its, of its land. In the wind, you can hear it, hear the voices in the wind of Katahdin. But while they're in the wilderness, they have this kind of a foundational experience and, and they're able to see through the appearance of things to the reality and bring that spiritual truth back into the human community and tell people in that community what's real as opposed to what appears to be. The mountain speaks to each one of us according to our own inner beliefs, whether they're religious or naturalists or whatever they are. When you come to Katahdin, you feel as though you're, you have these giant arms that are just wrapped around you and they engulf you with a kind of love and spirituality that you, you just don't feel anywhere else. Definitely a moving, living, spiritual piece of my life. Coming back every year just renews the spirit. It's a, a place of connection, a connection with, with good friends, making new friends. But I think the important part is, is connecting to our spirits. There's a little plaque here that has some words written by my Uncle Percy about his feelings about Mount Katahdin. When I came here when I was 12 years old with Meadowlark Camp, these were the first words that ever made any sense to me in my lifetime up till then, and I wanted to share them with you. They say, man is born to die, his works are short-lived, buildings crumble, monuments decay, and wealth vanishes. But Katahdin, in all its glory, forever shall remain the mountain of the people of Maine. That Percy was quite a little poet, and those words have inspired me for my entire life, as well as his works and his deeds. 
I reconnect with myself as well as I guess what I would feel is nature and I need that annually I need that reassertion of myself and uh, it's given to me here and uh, I treasure it and this mountain is, is a powerful being. People feel it whenever they go near it. And uh, Thoreau had an extraordinary experience on Katahdin. The contact passage and Thoreau's experience on Mount Katahdin. Thoreau famously stayed at Walden Pond for two years, two months, and two days between 1845 and 1847, almost exactly halfway between the period of time. If you take both ends and meet in the middle, about halfway during uh, Thoreau's stay at the pond, he went to the Maine woods, his first trip to the Maine woods, and climbed uh, Mount Katahdin, the highest uh, peak in the state of Maine. Uh, most of the trees at Walden Pond have been cut down long ago, and the stand of trees that I was living in was very sparse indeed. So I go to Katahdin uh, in the summer of 1846, and I encounter uh, truly a magnificent and wild wilderness. Uh, it looked at as, as if it had been created out of chaos and old night. This was that earth of which we have heard, made out of chaos and old night. Here was no man's garden but the unhandled globe. It was not lawn, not pasture, nor med, nor woodland, nor lay, nor arable, nor wasteland. It was the fresh and natural surface of the planet Earth. Henry David Thoreau. Uh, there were rocks thrown helter-skelter, uh, savage winds and, and uh, uh, snow on the top of Katahdin. So it was certainly a, a force of nature that I had never encountered before in my life. Uh, it was an enormously important experience for him, although I think I, I would want to qualify that a little bit. It might not have been as important as he certainly later made it important. So what he, what he did was basically, and a writer always has, what was the, your feet on the ground, your experience, actual experience at the time, as opposed to what do you later make it? Certainly later, when he came back from his climb of Mount Katahdin, he wrote an essay titled Katahdin or the Maine woods and uh, later sold it to the Union Magazine. And I climbed alone over huge rocks, loosely poised, a mile or more, still edging toward the clouds. For though the day was clear elsewhere, the summit was concealed in mist. The mountain seemed a vast aggregation of loose rocks, as if some time had rained rocks, and they lay as they fell on the mountainsides, nowhere fairly at rest but leaning on each other, all rocking stones, with cavities between, but scarcely any soil or smoother shelf. Henry David Thoreau. But what I'd like to do is just read what I regard as the most critical component of this long passage. It's among Thoreau scholars, it's, it's fair, fairly well known as the contact passage, and you'll see why in a moment. I stand in awe of my body, he writes. This matter to which I am bound has become so strange to me. I fear not spirits, ghosts of which I am one, that my body might, but I fear bodies. I tremble to meet them. What is this titan that has possession of me? Talk of mysteries, think of our life and nature, daily to be shown matter, to come in contact with it. Rock, trees, wind on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense, contact, contact, who are we, where are we? This is kind of, I think for Thoreau, this is kind of a seminal experience, This, an experience that you have out in the world that gets you down to some of the most foundational, fundamental questions, questions that even involve who you are, questions of identity, uh, epistemology, I mean, again, some of the most philosophically basic questions. Thoreau is up there and he has this almost sort of out-of-body experience, but I would call it an otherworldly experience. He, in a sense, lifts the veil from his perceptions and is able to in a, have a kind of a direct relationship with the environment and to see, uh, as I put it in, in, a, in, a, in an introduction that I wrote, for one of his later books, he's able to see the miraculous in the commonplace. And if you spend all your time in an office, I think it's very difficult to get this contact passage. 
I mean, you s see where he just kind of breaks down. Rocks, trees, wind on our cheeks, you know, solid earth, actual world, common sense, contact, contact, who are we? This guy's lost it. From a kind of a linguistic point of view, he's lost it. But it's the, again, from my point of view, it's the how do you push the envelope of your consciousness? How do you, how do you use language if you're a poet? How do you use language to make people understand what does Carlos Castaneda call it? Something reality, a, a different reality, a, a separate reality. Yeah, how do you do that? That's the, if you really are a prophet, how do you do that? What is the prophetic language? How do you, how do you use prophetic language? You have Moses on top of Mount Sinai, basically, being able to look at the Holy Land, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, uh, but on Mount Sinai, Mount Moses is up there and actually has in, in the Jewish myth, and Jewish Judeo-Christian tradition, actually speaks with God, experiences and, and communicates with the divine. And that's what's going on, I think, with Thor. He's tapping into that. He's trying to use the same, uh, he's trying to use that tradition to deepen the uh, flow of his own narrative. In other words, you have Thoreau on Mount Katahdin, you have Moses on Mount Sinai. There's a correspondence between the two, and Thoreau is attempting to leverage that correspondence to basically make his own essay a scripture. What Thoreau's doing here in Katahdin, I think, and, and, in, and frankly, in a lot of his best writing, is he's trying to tap into this whole experience that you could call the prophetic tradition. Um, in the prophetic tradition, at least from a Judeo-Christian point of view, you have the prophet who is a part of civilization and separates himself or herself from civilization, goes out into the wilderness, uh, and in the Judeo-Christian tradition for 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness and eats uh, locusts and honey and then comes back. But while they're in the wilderness, they have this kind of a foundational experience and, and they're able to see through the appearance of things to the reality and bring that spiritual truth back into the human community and tell people in that community what's real as opposed to what appears to be. Uh, that what we all take to be commonplace is something like a wafer of bread and a little bit of wine. They're very commonplace things, but if they're imbued with a different vision, they become purely sacramental, uh, miraculous uh, to these people who, in, in certain religious traditions. And what Thoreau, I think, says is that that particular insight, that these mundane things are at one moment mundane, but can be somehow <clears throat> transformed into miraculous uh, perception. You just need to learn how to look at it somewhat differently, and it's transformed into something quite miraculous. And what Thoreau is doing in his later work, he wrote a book called Wild Fruits, which explores that entire sacramental tradition and, and leverages that insight from the Judeo-Christian and other traditions for his own transcendentalist, American transcendentalist purposes. But it's basically trying to take uh, the insight that all nature is miraculous and bring it into contemporary American life. Katahdin, uh, you see nature behaving as nature should, whether it's uh, gale force winds or whether it's a, a horrible snowstorm or a rock slide or a mudslide. That is nature doing what nature is supposed to do. It is neither good nor bad, nature just is. And I learned that by being at Katahdin that I am part of that nature and I should be uh, as myself at all times just as nature is herself. The spirit of Katahdin. When I'm here, the mountain is huge and I am small and that the cares and concerns that I have are in the stretches of time very insignificant and therefore very much easier for me to deal with. We're here at Mount Katahdin in north central Maine in Baxter State Park. If you go back through the centuries, I mean, what was it like, you know, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, when the Wabanaki people and the Abnaki people and the Penobscots people lived, lived there on that land and revered that, that mountain as, as a spiritual sacred place. I can only imagine how they, had, they lived at that time and what, what their lives were like. 
and it's revered by the Wabanaki Indians as a sacred place. It's been revered by them throughout the millennia because they see the spirits here, they speak with the spirits here. It is a place where the Creator and the spirits reside and speak to those who are open and willing to listen. Well, yes, any, any time you go there, the, the spiritual communication is always there. It never goes away. The spirit of the mountain is always there, and it draws people there. It draws people that comes there who are non-Indians, and they don't know the reason why they are drawn there. But they are drawn there because of the spirit, the spirit of the mountain. We have legends that tells us how that mountain was formed. We have legends telling us how the mountain was uh, how sacred it is, and how, who the spirits are in the mountain. One of them is the uh, story of the legend of uh, Katahdin itself. The name Katahdin was uh, at one time one of our chiefs of one of the tribes. Gluskabe was sent by the Creator to the people of the eastern part of Turtle Island, the continent of the Americas, to teach all living plants, animals, birds, fish, insects, and especially men and women, how to live in harmony with each other. A young orphan boy came to live amongst the people. His name was Katahdin. He was taught by Gluskabi how to catch fish, hunt deer, how to skin and prepare them for eating, and how to make his clothes. He was taught the language of the trees, the wind, and the animals of the forest. Everyone in the tribe loved Katahdin for his kind, gentle ways. He was taught that all living things had a purpose for being on Earth. Katahdin became a very good leader of the tribe and an astute pupil of Gluskabi. The spirit of Katahdin lives within the massive mountain we call Katahdin in his honor. It is in this way that Katahdin is thought to embody the great teachings of the Creator. The sacred mountain is an inspiration to all who believe Katahdin to be a spirit who will lead mankind to his highest potential by bringing wisdom to all who open their hearts and minds to listening and learning. Arnie Neptune, Penobscot Elder. And uh, he uh, had uh, chosen as his wife uh, a lady called, uh, a woman called Sipsis, which means little bird. And he, um, he ma married the Sipsis. But uh, there was another chief that wanted Sipsis as his wife as well. And he uh, enlisted the aid of, of a shaman, a shaman lady called uh, Madaulin. Madaulin means uh, a spirit, spiritual person. This was an elderly, a real old lady who had uh, great powers, uh, magical powers. So the uh, chief the, uh, from the visiting tribe enlisted the aid of this lady to, to help him to acquire the love of Sipsis. The story goes, they chased uh, Katahdin and Sipsis through the woods, trying to get to them. And uh, when they got to that spot where Mount Katahdin is now, um, Katahdin, through his magic, made a copper kettle and for him and his bride, Sipsis, and they're under that to safety. And as they did that, rocks and stones and dirt and everything came down on the mountain, which was made by our teacher, Druskabi. And uh, he, was, he was also our savior, like uh, that took care of us for, um, and showed us how to live in the woods. So with that, that was the big, uh, beginning of the mountain, which we now call Katahdin, called Mount Katahdin. And the spirits of Katahdin and Sipsis are still there. And this is what is inside of the mountain. It speaks of, of an ancient time that still lives on that, on that mountain. The spirits of our people. And the spirits of the, uh, the Madaulin also hovers above the mountain at times. Uh, which you will see in the great storms at different times of the uh, year. There will be great storms that will be uh, always there above the mountain. There's always a fog or, or a cloud that's, that's always there. Sometimes it seemed as if the summit would be cleared in a few moments and smile in sunshine. But what was gained in one side was lost on another. It was like sitting in a chimney and waiting for the smoke to blow away. It was, in fact, a cloud factory. These were the cloud works, and the wind turned them off and on from the cool, bare rocks. Henry David Thoreau. So the spirits are there, and they call. They call to all people. 
We call to all the all people, whoever they are, especially the poets, people that takes pictures and just people that receive that message and they come and climb the mountain. And they receive that. They receive that spirit. They're able to talk. Talk to the spirit. Most of them don't know why they call there. They're just called and they respond and they come. But the but the rocks speak, the trees speak. Everything speaks. It has spirit. It's alive. And a lot of them don't know, but for me and our people, we know, we know it's a spirit, the spirit of Katahdin and Sipsis. Mount Katahdin, when I always go up, uh, the spirit of my ancestors do come out and they welcome me. They know who I am. They welcome me. People that walked there before me and that still walk there because our spirits are, are, we're drawn to that. We're drawn to that beautiful place. So, and we talk. And I don't assume that uh, I am a princess or anything. I am just equal to the Indian women that are there. Uh, now that I'm an elder, I am an elder, as the same as the elder ancestors. And, but they are much wiser because they lived in a different uh, dimension than I did. And so through them, they can help me go on in teaching me what to do out here. Both my mother and, and father were both Native people on the reservation, and um, all my lineage is all Native people. Mount Katahdin, when I always go up, I always look at it, and I always tell it that I will be back. Because to me, that is the most sacred place that I know of in, on Turtle Island, which is in the United States. I don't want to ever go by it without speaking to it and letting it know when I will be back. Because to me, it would be dishonorable to the mountain. So when I do come back from wherever I'm coming from, I do go in and I make sure that I am alone. Um, and I walk into the, up to the mountain. I greet it as if it's my mother. It is so sacred, the feeling that you have just overwhelms you. And it overwhelms you with love. And that is the most important thing. Everything that you have inside of you at the time could be fear, hate, whatever. It's actually gone because it's covered with the love that you feel. And to me, that is the most precious feeling that I could ever have and put inside of me to reassure that I am who I am and the love that I have inside for all human beings is almost equal to Katahdin, the sacred mountain. The Wabanaki all goes to the mountain and does ceremony and prays on the mountain, prays with the mountain, to the mountain, and offers that tobacco and the sage and all, all the prayers. For, and when we pray, all of us, when, when the Indians, we pray, we don't pray just for our own people. We pray for all people of the earth because we are the keepers of the earth. So we have to pray for and honor all people and all living things of the earth all the way around the globe. Spirituality, I think, is is always with you. There's always a spirit guide with you. Um, they're always there at home, whether you're at work, whether, you know, you certainly don't have to be in a certain setting uh, to feel different things, but it's accentuated 100% up here. Uh, you're much more, much more open to what can come in and you're, you're able to let the things in instead of being closed off in another setting. Um, the spirituality up here is just, it, it's, it's indescribable. And it just engulfs you with love and safety and everything that you could possibly have. And the mountain always seems to know what you have done. And it reaffirms and, and a lot of people say pray, but I talk. Uh, I don't have any special prayers, but I just talk. And when I do talk, I just say the things that needed to be done out here. How can I do it? 
which way should I go? And see if I can get the lessons that I want in return from the mountain, from grandfather or grandmother or um, of the, our ancestors and everything and to come out here and spread whatever they want me to do. And that is to bring love in a peaceful way for all human beings and bring us back to unity and, and love. And people are so afraid of love and I am not. So that's, what I, that's how I live my life as it is now. I am me and I will not change and I can't change because I have the love inside of me. My heart could not and will not take hatred back or fear back. It's been replaced with love. If one just feels and listens to, to what is happening around you, you become, you become one with the mountain in the sense that you're part of a living entity. This year marks my second voyage to Katahdin and it's, although I've hiked in several different locations, nothing can possibly compare to this place. It's, it's ethereal, it's the most spiritual place I've ever been. It helps to ground you um, and, and, and you're taken away from the everyday woes of life and able to put things in perspective. Uh, you, you'll just look up at this massive amount of beauty that just surrounds you. It just engulfs you and, and you realize that you're just such a speck in the big picture and that those everyday troubles that seem to bog you down are nothing. The magnitude of this place just can't even be put into words. It's, it's just amazing. And it doesn't matter what the weather conditions are. You're, you're just always in, in awe of nature. And I come here because there's a definitely a religious or a spiritual pull. I've traveled fairly extensively, and the only place on the earth that I can say that really pulled me like a Tadden did were the Red Rocks of Sedona. But even when I was in the Red Rocks, I don't recall the same feeling that I get sitting here at Chimney Pond. Coming here with my friends that we've formed the Monks of Katahdin. It's a special thing to be part of. It's a brotherhood. I'm always drawn here by the, the spirituality. Uh, we took a, a midnight hike the other night to watch the, the moonlight. It was a full moon and I started noticing things that I guess I hadn't paid attention to before. Um, we ended up walking up to, to the peak and as you walked up the moon was starting to set on one side of you and the sun was about to come up on the other and the moon turned this amazing orange color and it looked just like the sun coming up. And you almost had to stop and think about where it was that you were and what you were looking at. Uh, and to watch that spectacular sunrise and watch the shadow of the cone appear of the mountain in the background, it's just, it's breathtaking. Um, and, you know, although in everyday life you're surrounded by your spirit guides and, and you're aware that they're there, the hustle and bustle of life just seems to take it away from you and you're not as able to, to really open up and, and feel what you can feel up here. When you come up here, it, it's like you're, you're wrapped and engulfed in this, this blanket of caring and nurturing and you're never alone. Although you could be sitting out, you know, in the middle of a, a pond by yourself, surrounded by what you think is nothing, there, there are things that are with you at all times, and, and it's just such an incredible feeling. Um, you just feel as though, you know, someone's taking that big blanket and wrapping you up and, and saying, everything's going to be okay, you can do it. If you stop and listen to the sounds that the mountain is, is and what the mountain, the vibration of the mountain, what it's giving off. By day, man stands spellbound in the solitude where man himself is an atom at the base of one of nature's noblest creations. 
By night, he is inspired by the majesty of the moon as it rises and moves westward in a stately curve over the serrated peaks, which throw themselves up into the deep blue of the night as though to join the company of the stars. Percival Proctor Baxter. There's like a heartbeat. There's a heartbeat, there's a connection there, a real connection on the spiritual sense. I'm drawn here largely because, as Jeff said, it's spiritually invigorating. And I reconnect with myself as well as, I guess, what I would feel is nature. And I need that annually. I need that reassertion of myself. And uh, it's given to me here, and uh, I treasure it. It has its own poetic enchantment. But you have to sense it and be able to feel that, become one with, one with the mountain, one with nature, more or less. But nature is all around us, so the mountain speaks for itself, if, if you can follow me. There were spirits lived there according to their beliefs, and I, and I believe that today, that you, know, you can hear it in the, in the voice of the wind crying across knife's edge blowing up above the mountain you can hear it in the, the crashing of the thunder you can see it in the in the clouds where the clouds come over can time and engulfs it like a blanket it holds it there's there's something to that that's special than any other other place around do you feel loved by the mountain absolutely as we as we were driving in here i mean we, we, we rounded a corner and each one of us in the car immediately said the same thing. We're entering a stretch where no conversation needs to take place. The mountain was calling us to sit here and look at this incredible bowl. Only those that have been here can appreciate that. Katahdin is a, is a very, very special place. I have a, a unique tale to tell. On a night that we climbed under a full moon, we climbed during the night, went up Hamlin Ridge and came over the, the peak across the tabletop. And as we were approaching Baxter Peak, I was running out of time and quite frankly, I was running out of gas. And Jeff came bounding down from the top. Keep me company to cheer me on. I can make it, I can make it for sunrise. And I said, I need to have a picture of me here, climbing, I'm so close to sunrise. And Jeff took a picture of me. I have the picture. In fact, I have it on my computer screen as my screensaver. The interesting part about that is, Jeff didn't make the summit that evening. Jeff opted to stay in the tabletop with a couple of injured climbers and tired climbers that weren't going to make the summit for sunrise. But Jeff took a picture of me, and I have a picture to show it. So somehow, the spirits of Katahdin came through, and there's no denying it. All of us experienced something that night, and I have a picture to support my story. Nobody in the group stated that they took that picture. I know Jeff took that picture. Katahdin talks to you in the sense that you're ready to receive it. And so to me, I always come up here and get a renewed sense of energy. I'm a senior grandma now, so I probably won't be coming up a lot more, but it'll still continue to speak to me. And it's a, a wonderful spot, and I know it will speak to each person who travels through the trails here. It will mean a great deal to them always. Yesterday, uh, I had climbed probably close to somewhere between 10 and 15 miles, and it, it was beautiful and picturesque no matter where we went, and you really felt a sense of accomplishment. But there were certain times that you kind of had to look at it and say, oh, I don't know if I'm in for that. I don't know if I can do that. And you always had that reassuring feeling that, yes, you could. It was going to be OK. And uh, my friend Bill and I were walking along Hamlin Ridge, and it was beautiful. And the wind picked up. 
and it started to almost move you over the edge and it kind of gave you that nervous feeling and but then all of a sudden I knew that my grandmother was with me and it was as though she was hugging me and telling me everything was going to be okay and to keep going because I could do it and so when I had lost faith in myself she had put the faith back in for me and actually it was such a powerful feeling that it actually brought a tear to my eye um, it was just such a warm caring feeling the tops of mountains are among the unfinished parts of the globe whether it is a slight insult to the gods to climb and pry into their secrets and try their effect on our humanity only daring and insolent men perchance go there simple races do not climb mountains. Their tops are sacred and mysterious tracks never visited by them. Pomola is always angry with those who climb to the summit of Katahdin. Henry David Thoreau. As Connie said, my great-great-grandfather was one of the first ones to go above the tree line to challenge the Pomola, who would always come down and devour anyone who went above the tree line. So. But uh, my father, my grandfather challenged them by going up there and uh, uh, creating a, a, a dwelling and then sealing it over with ice so that the, the uh, Bamola could not come down and, and capture him or eat him. So uh, he did that by putting a water over, over, the, uh, over the entrance and, and having it frozen. So when Bamola came down, he wasn't able to get in to, to get get my grandfather. So he proved to all the people that he was able to, you were able to go above the tree line without having to be devoured by this Pamola. And that's, that's one of the small legends that we have about the mountain. And it's talk to people and let them know that there is love. And there is there another dimension for them as they grow up. But we need to know there is another dimension that we are all going at, and we can take it now. We can spread it now. It's overwhelming because it touches my soul. Katahdin is, to me, the most sacred mountain. So please, go see the mountain. To most people, Mount Katahdin is but a name. To those who have both seen and climbed the mountain, it is a wonderful reality. And the memories of a trip to its summit remain vivid through the years. At present, the great mountain, weathered beaten by time and scarred by the avalanche, is almost inaccessible, the journey entailing expense, hardship, and discomfort. The grandeur of the mountain, its precipitous slopes, its massive cliffs, Unusual formation and wonderful coloring cannot be surpassed or even equaled by any mountain east of the Mississippi River. Katahdin rises abruptly from the plain to the height of 5,273 feet and without foothills to detract from its solitary dignity, stands alone, a grim gray tower overlooking the surrounding country for hundreds of miles. It is a small wonder that the Aboriginal Indians believed it to be the home of the spirits of the wind, storm, and thunder. Percival Proctor Baxter. Katahdin is slowly eroding away, but my people are still there. My ancestors are still there, and they will always be there. And if it's meant for me to go and join my ancestors, I would very, very much welcome to join my ancestors. My great-grand-uncle, Percival Proctor Baxter, had a vision that this mountain needed to be preserved for all time. And he tried to get the state of Maine to buy this mountain. In fact, he offered his salary as governor of Maine to go towards the purchase of it. He was refused twice. And when he stopped being governor of Maine in 1924, he started amassing the land here it took him 15 years to acquire the mountain that you see here, Mount Katahdin, and then he spent another 15 years amassing 200,000 acres that he gave to the people of Maine with deeds of trust to hold it forever wild. 
This mountain raises its head aloft unafraid of the passing storm and is typical of the rugged character of the people of Maine. The establishment of this park will lay the foundation of a policy whereby the present generation will deliver a great inheritance to the generations to come. Percival Proctor Baxter. The deeds of trust by Percival Baxter have been honored and this mountain and this park and this 200,000 acres remains forever wild, but as a public park for the people to enjoy. There are one lane dirt roads here and no water, no running water, no electricity, just as Percival Baxter intended. The interesting thing about this area is that Percival Baxter had the vision to keep this mountain in the rhythms of creation. He kept this 200,000 acres without running water, without electricity. He kept them in balance with the rhythms of creation, in balance with the cycles of the earth. The interesting thing is, is that out in Arizona, the Hopi Indians have had a similar mandate, they feel, from the creator to keep their land simple and in the balance with creation. There's one village there called Hot Villa and a small number of families who've kept those rhythms going. They have, they have no running water, no electricity, even today. They haul their water and they use generators when they need electricity. But they feel that the creator has instructed them to stay in balance with the rhythms of life. And they are doing just that for humanity. And here is Baxter State Park in the rhythms of life, thanks to Percival Baxter, who had the vision to keep this place in its pristine and untouched. Henry David Thoreau was a mystic. He, he stated that himself. And my understanding of what a mystic is, is someone who sees a bigger reality. And uh, the, the mystical nature of Katahdin, that Katahdin somehow, uh, this energy of Katahdin is somehow exists in that bigger reality. And um, the Native Americans understand this bigger reality. So that's why I brought Arnie Neptune, the ideas of Thoreau, Katahdin together here with my ideas of bridging them all together and creating this bridge into a bigger reality. That until we open our hearts and minds to this broader understanding of reality, that we cannot get to that vision of peace, of freedom, of liberty and justice for all that this country has promised the world it would be.